Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Energy Central Power Perspectives podcast. This is the show that brings together leading minds in energy to discuss the latest challenges and trends transforming and modernizing the utility industry of the future. And a quick thank you to Indigo Advisory Group, our sponsor of today's show. Now, let's talk energy. I'm your host, Jason Price, coming to you from New York City. And with me, as always, from Orlando, Florida, is Energy Central producer and community manager, Matt Chester. Matt, today's episode brings another first for us on power perspectives, and that's the fact that we have not one, not two, but three guests joining us today. And this all-star lineup of guests is because of the depth of the information and the vital importance of today's episode, where we're going to tackle the world of grid tech. This is the type of term that can mean different things to different people. So Matt, can you level set for our audience? What is it that we mean when we discuss the term grid tech? Certainly, Jason, and, and you're definitely right that the term grid tech, it's one that covers a lot of different technologies, a lot of real estate, and really it's, it's anytime something like a sensor, communication of data, or new advanced software is added to the grid. That's the type of grid tech that we're talking about. Another term listeners are, are no doubt familiar with is the smart grid, and grid tech largely comprises the various pieces necessary to make this more intelligent smart grid possible, a grid where you know energy is flowing in two directions, where various assets are always talking to each other, and where algorithms and intelligence can be used to optimize everything from the quality, the quantity, and even the location of power on the grid. Thanks for that, Matt. And as you noted, that's just the beginning. And so to really dive into the world of grid tech, we should waste no time bringing on today's guests. And members of the Energy Central community will recognize these guests and this topic as they have submitted to the community a three-part series about how the grid tech market has evolved, the current market dynamics and the applications, and how frontier technologies will impact grid tech market going forward. And this podcast is our opportunity to dive even further into that topic with them. So first is David Gork, Managing Director of Indigo Advisory Group. Welcome to the show, David. Thank you, Jason. Great to be here. Yes, yeah, so we're thrilled to have you. Next is his colleague, Leo Trudell, the Innovation and Technology Director of Indigo Advisory Group. Pleasure to have you here as well, Leo. Thank you for having me. And last but not least, the super team is rounded out by Paul Sayor, Strategy and Research Analyst at Indigo Advisory Group. Thanks for being here today as well, Paul. Yeah, it's a pleasure, Jason. Thanks for having us. Terrific. So the podcast booth is packed today. So what I'd love to do is first get each of you to speak specifically to the portion of the Grid Tech article series you reported on, and then we'll bring it all together with some added conversation. So let's start with David, who wrote about the evolution of the market and the current macro trends. David, by this point in time, we're all familiar with the term smart grid and all the different technologies and practices that it covers. But the advent of the smart grid era was one of massive transformation. For our listeners, can you give a background to the early years of smart grid and how grid tech has evolved. Also, please elaborate on what are the current market drivers and what benefits are we expecting to see? Great, thanks Jason. And great timely question. I, I think Matt done a pretty decent job of defining what grid tech is. But as you say, if we, if we take up the industry, um, at, let's say 10 years ago, where there was a lot of public funding through the American um, Reinvestment and Recovery Act, um, and utilities were rolling out um, mesh networks and um, AMI programs, upgrading core systems. And um, there was a lot of emphasis on the term smart grid and all of the activity and use cases associated with that. And really, the way we, we look at that is the smart grid era really ushered in foundational technologies for utilities to use. And we saw large programs, billions of dollars, and benefits emerge from that. And the point we're at now and why it's interesting and um, to look at this market again is we're about to undergo another huge investment round. There's different drivers, different metrics in the industry. So grid tech for us is all of that networking and, and software and data management processes that utilities um, 
deploy to manage the grid. And where we draw the line is we're not per se looking at generating technologies. We're looking at technologies that sit on the transmission distribution network, those technologies that coordinate distributed energy resources. And it's a very software heavy market. And that's what grid tech means um, to us. It's, it's a multi-billion dollar market. There's hundreds of use cases, there's thousands of vendors. And we felt it was important to look at this market in isolation from the other conversations, because this is something utilities can control or power companies. And there is a lot of startup activity here. We'll talk about some of that, hopefully. Um, but we wanted to look at this market, refresh it from 10 years ago and see what does grid tech, smart grid mean in the coming years for the power sector. And to the second part of your question, Jason, the drivers, the drivers are different than they were 10 years ago in the last round of stimulus and, and investments here. I mean, in the last 10 years, in fact, the, the cost of delivery power has, has gone up. And so the EIA, and say the cost has gone from 2.6 cents per kilowatt hour in 2010 to 4.3 cents per kilowatt hour in 2020. So that's nearly equal to the cost of generating the power itself. And, you know, looking at technology and how it can bring down those, those key metrics um, is certainly a driver for the industry. And secondly, this time around, as opposed to 10 years ago, we've been much more focused, obviously, on decarbonization. And, you know, the electricity and heat sector. Um, must decarbonize by 7,700 million metric tons of CO2 by 2030. Um, some of that is new generating technologies, new transmission, of course, but there's a component of this, um, about 500 um, million metric tons of CO2, which is um, um, related to technical losses on the grid. So over 5% of total decarbonization efforts could be delivered directly by grid tech. And we think that that's an important focus for new technologies. Um, there's other drivers here around the controlling new devices at the edge of the grid. One of the markets with another term, grid edge, that we've looked at, and it, it has seen an explosion of DORs, e-mobility assets, and new business models at the edge of the grid. And in order to enable these business models, there's a lot of foundational technologies utilities need to react to, let's say, FERC 2222, Derm systems, virtual power plant software. So we're seeing regulation lead to new business models and then technology having a role in that grid tech. And then finally, there's, there's a lot of drivers around deferred investment at the moment and looking at how digitization perhaps in the entire sector could drive out you know, 270 billion um, of deferred investment by 2040, according to the IEA. So in sum, we've matured a lot since 10 years ago, Jason. There was a lot of investment. We have a foundation. But by looking at this discrete market of non-generating technologies and everything that the utility controls across the energy value chain, we think there's, there's great value for analyzing this market for power companies, startups, investors, et cetera. Hopefully that was, was helpful. Oh, it certainly was. That's terrific context. Certainly critical towards recognizing why things are the way they are in today's landscape. So now the next stage of the series of articles you published, which can be found on Energy Central, is with Paul where you talked about the current environment of grid tech. So Paul, over to you. As you look at the state of grid tech today and the vast investments in innovation, what are you finding most interesting and where do you see the most exciting potential in the market? Yeah, thanks, Jason. Yeah, so there's a lot of really like important things to be excited about here. Like Dave mentioned, grid tech is a, it's a really high growth, large market. It's actually set to be valued at about 640 billion by 2030 with a compound annual growth rate of just coming in over 19%. And so when you break it down and look at it with a closer lens, you'll see that this market is actually comprised of six discrete sub-markets. And each of these have their own flair and unique set of use cases and vendors. And so these sub-markets are e-mobility, which is, you know, obviously encompasses EV charging infrastructure, but also other use cases like customer intelligence for informing EV propensity modeling. The second submarket is flexibility, and this is a really important one. This includes things like virtual power plants and derms for enabling flexible capacity, um, as well as battery and building management systems. Our third submarket is 
robotics and connected worker. Obviously, this includes a, a range of robotics, such as drones, climbers, dogs are coming into play here. And then a lot of software-based use cases as well, such as damage prevention for gas infrastructure. You know, our fourth market is digital asset management. So this is also a really big one. This includes things like digital twins on the uh, frontier side of things, but then also software solutions that are enabling vegetation management, you know, including things like, you know, machine learning and artificial intelligence to help enable those solutions. And then you have your asset performance management with both preventative and predictive capabilities. Our fifth submarket is core systems. So this is a really legacy heavy submarket, but there's a lot of technological refresh going on here, particularly using artificial intelligence and machine learning to help bid renewables into the market and conduct energy market forecasting and predictions. But you know, there's also some, like I said, some refresh being done on these older systems. So you know, advanced distribution management systems are being rolled out, which is a combination of outage management systems and, you know, your traditional distribution management system. So a lot of really great things there as well. And then lastly, our submarket is optimization technologies. That's anything that has grid enhancing capabilities specifically, sort of on the, tr the transmission side of things. So that includes dynamic line rating, which helps increase line capacity, as well as things like advanced power flow controls. So these submarkets, you know, pretty vast, and there's thousands of vendors, like Dave mentioned, that serves these. We're clocking in at about 175 unique high-value use cases here. While there's a lot of difference, each one of these submarkets are actually uh, essential to achieving future utility goals and outcomes. In terms of what we're really excited about, though, there's a few high-growth areas that I'd like to dive into. And I think a great example of, of a high-growth area is the flexibility submarket. So I just like to take a moment to really flesh out and break down what's happening here um, as an example of what's going on in, in grid tech as a whole. So our flexibility market currently valued at around 45 billion with a compound annual growth rate of about 17%. And we find that actually 25% of our use cases fall into our flexibility submarket. So a lot of activity happening on the financing side of things as well as the uh, vendor delivery side of things. And so when, when we say flexibility, let's just take a moment to dive into that a little bit deeper. So so what do we mean? So our flexibility submarket, we define it as including types of innovative tech that provide load balancing and resilient energy alternatives in times of grid uncertainty and grid stress. So this could include things like microgrids for islanding during outages, demand response systems for peak load curtailment, or battery and building management systems for additional flexible capacity. And there's a host of other software solutions and tech in this market as well that, that I'm just not going to touch on currently. But um, it's a really large and burgeoning submarket. And so why is this important? This is particularly important for utilities because rather than building out costly transmission infrastructure like they've traditionally done, utilities can actually implement some of these flexibility solutions to help defer their capital spending and unlock previously inaccessible generation capacity. Um, and this generation capacity is, is both greener and more resilient. So that's a plus as well. So another important reason that this submarket is really hot and, and we're really excited about it is that this is a main driver of deep carbonization, right? So Helping roll out these DPPs and DERMs, for example, are, it's, it's really going to aid us in integrating this colossal influx of DERs onto the grid that we're seeing. The DOE estimates that the U.S. needs an additional 1,000 gigawatts of solar capacity to be deployed on the grid by 2035. Um, and that's in order to track to our national decarb targets in 2050. And so this flexibility submarket is going to be crucial in helping us get there. And so, you know, why is this such a hot market? What's going on here? So there's sort of three key drivers that are creating a, a perfect storm for this submarket. The first being it's a really great regulatory environment currently, and it's conducive to innovation on both the business model and tech front. Um, as you probably know, FERC 2222 was passed back in 2020. And so that's opening up all these wholesale markets across the RTOs and ISOs to distributed energy resources. And so it's allowing for much more flexible capacity to come online. And so we're seeing utilities across the board prepare for this prepare for this wave of market innovation and market opportunities in parallel with all of the compliance meetings that the ISO and RTO have RTOs have been having with FERC over the past couple months. So that's one reason. The second reason is just, you know, simply utilities are on board with decarbonization. They've set really progressive decarb targets and these aggressive targets are helping them drive the need for clean, non-traditional forms of generation. So that's another key driver. And lastly, the technology here um, is ready. With advancements in artificial intelligence and machine learning and unsupervised learning and other pattern recognition methods, it's really allowing for a lot of startups and vendors to develop things like DPPs and DERMs that um, were pretty costly and complicated to develop in the past. 
And these are essential for controlling these clean distributed assets um, cheaply and really effectively. So those three drivers are really creating like, you know, the perfect storm for the flexibility market. We're really excited about that right now. You know, there's a lot of financial activity as well. You know, these larger private equity and venture firms, such as Energy Impact Partners, Blue Bear Capital. There's a couple of venture arms from the utilities, such as National Grid Partners and BP Ventures that are all pouring money into this space. I mean, they're pouring money into grid tech as a whole, but, you know, specifically into flexibility. So that's really exciting to see. And and with all that money, there's been a bit of a Cambrian explosion of, of vendors and startups that are you know, really driving success in this submarket. Another great piece of evidence as to why this is such a great area right now is that there's a lot of incumbent activity surrounding acquisitions of, of startups. You know, GE, Generac, Schneider Electric have all acquired smaller BPP and, and DERMS startups in, within the past year. But of course, we've seen larger companies like STEM go public. So this is just a bit of a taste of what we're covering in grid tech as a whole. But in terms of, you know, areas that are really hot, really excited about flexibility has got to be included in there. And again, we're tracking deployments across all of these sub markets. And so we've actually identified a list of high performing vendors that we're naming, you know, our grid tech 150. So this is basically an all-star list of vendors that participate in the markets. And, you know, it doesn't just include flexibility, but between all that, there's a lot of healthy activity and we're really excited about grid tech going forward. That's great. And there's a lot there. And I really appreciate how you framed it with the sub markets. So thanks, Paul. But as you've already heard, the space seems to be one of rapid development. Being state of the art one year could readily turn into falling behind the curve in the ensuing years if utilities don't continue to evaluate and improve. So over to you, Leo. Your part of the article series was to look at the future of grid tech. I just want to turn it over to give our listeners a taste. From you, how are frontier technologies impacting the grid tech market and what can we come to expect from grid tech landscape in the next five to 10 years? That's a great question, Jason, and it's closely connected to the shifting macros that will define the utility sector going forward. In order to decarbonize, utilities are going to have to make their grids more connected and more capable of collecting and transferring much, much more data as they'll need to enable more automation and automated decision-making to manage the flow of power from distributed energy resources. Utilities are also going to have to lower their costs and get better at managing employee turnover, as both of these things are rising as a result of higher complexity and an accelerating retirement rate. So on the technical front, utilities are playing catch up because they have historically prioritized reliability and grid security over modernization. And there's good reason for this. Protocol-driven processes are great for administering systems that deliver uninterrupted power 24-7, 365, but they're not so great for experimenting and learning what new technologies work best. In terms of modernization, the utility sector is gradually adopting solutions that are already in use in other asset-heavy industries. And here are a few themes that we're seeing. Uh, The first is robotics. So this is one area that has logically taken utilities more time relative to other asset-heavy industries to adopt. And this is because other industries that utilize robots generally use them on assembly lines, whereas utility robots need to be mobile, agile, dynamic, and have advanced battery technology because they won't be very useful plugged into a wall. There are four main robot types that we're seeing, and these are drones, agile mobile robots, or dogs, which Paul referenced earlier. These are the quadrupedal designs that were popularized by Boston Dynamics. Wall climbing robots and underwater autonomous vehicles or subs. These four models provide for flight, mobility across uneven terrain, mobility up vertical walls and poles, and mobility through water, which accounts for most of the mobility requirements utilities need. Another theme that has taken over in adjacent industries and is in the early innings in the utility sector is software as a service, or SaaS. Most utilities continue to run software on local servers just as everyone did in the 90s. The problem is this is extremely inefficient because it requires maintenance of server stacks, which are virtually always underutilized and often outdated. It is also increasingly a complicated strategy because most software is developed for the cloud these days, meaning that utilities don't have access to the most advanced software capabilities on the market today. One reason why utilities continue to do this is because of the perception of increased security, but the bigger cause actually is that cloud software generally cannot be added to the rate base. Thus, utilities may spend 10 times what they would pay for cloud software on maintenance of server stacks, but the cost of server infrastructure can be passed to customers, while SaaS fees generally cannot. Thus, utilities that invest in cloud software generally do so at the expense of their margins. It's up to regulatory authorities to change this. And while there are some early proposals in forward-thinking states, regulators need to accelerate this so utilities can embrace the transition to the cloud as soon as possible. Doing so will accelerate decarbonization and also lower energy costs for consumers. A final thing I want to highlight from the technology perspective is distributed intelligence. 
This includes the move to the cloud, which we just discussed, but it also includes edge computing. Edge computing is useful for high volumes of data that need to be actionable in near real time. For example, let's say a transmission utility wants to reduce line loss by optimizing the phase angle using phaser measurement units or PMUs as they're called. This involves taking numerous measurements per second and reacting to them in real time. If you need to send all that data over a network to a server and wait for that server to respond, network latency will eat up too much time for this use case to work. But if you can use an edge device to do the data reduction before it hits the network, or if you can use an edge device to do the analysis and make decisions without using the network at all, then this use case works. So we're seeing movement in that direction. A final point I wanna make here is that we're also seeing transformation from an organizational perspective in that we are seeing more internal innovation teams than ever before. Many utilities already support R&D teams that take on long-term projects, but innovation teams tend to focus on near and medium-term deployment of technical capabilities. So much of their work is focused on identifying internal processes and routines that can be made more efficient, finding the right technical capabilities to evolve how that work is done, sourcing and diligencing vendors, ensuring those vendors can work with existing tech stacks, structuring and commissioning pilot demonstrations and proof of concepts, and assessing the results to determine if they should be scaled organization-wide. This trend is leading to faster deployments across the three technical areas I highlighted earlier, which were robotics, SaaS, and distributed computing. And we expect this trend to continue and in fact accelerate. That was terrific, Leo, and no doubt hitting high notes for uh, our listeners. So let's now open up the floor. As you know, our podcast listening audience is made up of leaders in the utility sector. So knowing you have their attention, I'm curious what messages you have for those utility professionals, both the ones that are perhaps not integrating grid tech at the speed that they should, but also the ones that are constantly seeking to innovate. And welcome any of you to speak and respond to that question. So the floor is yours. Great question, Jason. And power companies, utilities, they're all at different levels of maturities and depending on, on, on their local jurisdiction and, the, and their regulatory framework or their appetite for risk or technology and, or, or just their general internal capabilities. And so the, there's, a, there's a real range of preparedness across the industry. You know, because it's such a complicated market and there are so many use cases, deciding on what use cases to focus on or what technologies are commercially available and, and to bring in house and who to partner with is pretty key. So firstly, as in 2010, when utilities were building out these large AMI business cases, um, you know, it's important to build out these holistic business cases that aren't double dipping, dipping on benefits and that reflect the utilities goals around decarbonization and better cost management and, and better capital management, et cetera. So really understanding the tech, building out the business cases and understanding those multi-year ITOT roadmaps are important at this time. And just given the level of activity in the startup community, given the funding and so on, and so that's one piece of it. So understanding what's out there and understanding the capability and maturity within a utility and their local drivers and aligning their own roadmap. And in light of all of these, these opportunities and some of the use cases we touched on in the markets, um, a piece of that is really understanding interoperability of these use cases across transmission distribution, the network. Um, NIST had a report out last year that said, um, the cost of non-interoperable, integrating non-interoperable technology in, in the power sector a year ranges from about 140 million to, to a billion, a pretty big range. But there's certainly a cost with not creating that reference architecture and looking at and tech stacks that are interoperable. And really, you know, getting your kind of uh, grid tech A team together on whatever vertical or problem it is across vendors, that's a big emphasis right now. And Part of that, and related to doing your business case and looking at your reference architecture, we're encouraging utilities, and some utilities are doing this very well, and are rolling in scanning and scouting functions. So in order to better understand the markets and the vendors, the different use cases, what other utilities are doing, and having those dedicated roles will serve utilities well. And they're related to the role that Leo actually just mentioned around those innovation teams that are deploying commercially available solutions. We feel that's that's pretty pretty key. The main point of all of this is, you know, because you know Paul covered what all these all these markets are and, and Leo the frontier technologies, it's it's a pretty diverse landscape and each of these use cases solves for different metrics. And so really understanding your business drivers and aligning your technology vision to the utility vision 
and creating that multi-year roadmap is a really big opportunity now, and particularly with the funding that's coming available and, and just the maturity of solutions. We think that will serve our companies well. I'll piggyback on this question and say that utilities should partner with more startups. Another contributing factor to utility slowness in adopting good software solutions is that they rely on their trusted manufacturing partners to develop it for them. Companies like ABB, GE, Siemens, and Schneider Electric those companies will continue to have a major role as the sector's primary vendors, but unlike, or sorry, like utilities, their organizational designs are optimized for reliability, not for innovation. This means that their innovation cycles are slow and some of the software they develop isn't best in class, doesn't integrate well with existing tech stacks, and ultimately doesn't move the industry forward at the rate it needs to. Contrast this with smaller software-focused companies that do have organizational designs that are optimized for rapid cycle innovation. These are the companies that will transform the sector, not only the quickest, but will result in higher levels of reliability. There are separate risks, obviously, to working with startups and internal innovation teams should focus on understanding those risks so they can properly assess them. Yeah, that makes complete sense. And there's certainly a lot to think about. And we've seen that in parallels in other industries, right? So I agree with you. Paul, you had said some comments around the funding environment. So I wanna, I wanna pull that thread a little bit further, if I may. So recent legislation has seemed to open up new levels of funding that might be going towards this type of grid tech. So how do you see that availability of public money influencing the speed and direction of the sector? Yeah, great question, Jason. Yeah, so like you said, there's been some really historically significant energy-related activity in the legislative space, both between the Build Back Better Act and the uh, Inflation Reduction Act. And so between the two of those, we're actually tracking $350 billion of direct and indirect public money. And this includes billions for smart grid technology and, and you know, that's flowing into to grid tech as well. And so, you know, the public money is very, very significant here. However, it's, it's not just public money. Between the past two years, we've actually seen 23 billion invested in startups and M&A activity and then and SBACs as well. So there's a healthy stream of both private capital and public capital directed towards this market right now. And so that's going to see similar to know, about 10 years ago, there's going to be a significant boom in both vendors and, you know, valuable solutions. In order for utilities and, and states to actually take advantage of this money and this high capital influx, they should stay tuned to the DOE schedules and the various releases for the, the grants and loans coming out. But in parallel, and Leo mentioned this as well, utilities should be building partnerships with vendors and labs and research institutions to accelerate their grid tech deployments to ultimately unlock this large flow of capital that's coming into the industry. I'll just jump in there quickly on that too. There, so specifically, getting familiar with the DOE's Grid Deployment Office, um, particularly the Grid Resilience and Innovation Partnership Program, and that's pretty focused on the grid tech market. They have about 10 billion to deploy right now, and their, their schedule of funding is out. And so tracking that is, is pretty key, but also taking those lessons learned from the AARA and looking through the startups that have deployments elsewhere and really understanding who your kind of grid tech A team is at this point and will we'll serve utilities well as, as they go look at this public money and interact with the market. We think that that's a really key first step um, for the kind of next generation of, of grid tech, Jason. Well, that was excellent and incredibly thorough. So really appreciate the conversation here. And we've definitely learned a lot and there's a lot to think about around grid tech. But we also want to learn more about you three. So to do that, we're going to put you through our traditional lightning round, which gives us an opportunity to learn more about you, the person, rather than you, just the professional. We're going to ask you a set of questions. You'll have one word or phrase response. Let's go with the order of David, Leo, and Paul. Is each of you ready? Ready as I'll ever be. Let's okay. do it. What's your favorite piece of technology or gadget you use in your day-to-day -day life? Mine is a, a remarkable, it's a paper tablet that I have attached to me at all times. My iPhone? Mine's got to be my Apple AirPod Pros. What is your dream vacation? Dream vacation? Southeast Asia, one of the countries. The Congo River Basin. I'm going to have to copy Dave on this one. It's going to be Southeast Asia, but I want a motorcycle throughout the entirety of it. <laughs> Name one guest, past or present, that you'd have at your ideal dinner party. I would definitely have a, a place sitting for Bono from the U2. 
Trey Parker, creator of South Park in the Book of Mormon. Mine's got to be Jimi Hendrix. What's the best career advice you've ever gotten? I think don't overestimate the impact of technology in the short term, but don't underestimate them in the long term. The best career advice I ever got was listen to your collaborators. Yeah, the best career advice I've ever gotten was just be authentic. And what are you most passionate about? Passionate about working as part of the decarbonization movement and professionally, you know, and personally and driving towards the, the goals we set ourselves and, and achieving those. Yeah, so I'm going to yes. stick with the theme here and say that I'm going to have to copy Dave. I, you know, worked in another sector prior to uh, moving over to clean tech and made the move uh, with a lot of uncertainty, but did so because I think it's the most important thing I can spend my time working on right now. So for myself, personally, I'd say music, but professionally, I got to go with you know, trying to overcome one of the greatest challenges of our generation, which is climate change and being part of the decarbonization movement. Terrific. Thank you for indulging us in the lightning round and getting to know a bit more about each of you. And now, as we wrap up the show, it's time for you to deliver your final message. And I want to go around the horn and ask each of you for one takeaway note or piece of advice that you hope sticks with our audience of listeners today. David, you want to start? Sure, Jason. Yeah, I think the, the key message is that there is huge opportunity in grid tech by, you know, really examining the market, the use cases, the standards, the benefits, aligning those to a utility strategy. You can create a, a pretty holistic strategy. You know, this requires systems thinking to deploy and um, all of the technology that we're looking at and, and having the knowledge available of what's available is pretty key. And, and we're hoping that we are providing some of that. Yeah, I would say that the bottleneck, in my view, to decarbonization is implementation. Obviously, it's, it's a very complex path to decarbonization. And there are a lot of factors that limit the speed that we can go at here. But the bottleneck is implementation. But I do think that with focusing attention in the right areas by identifying the right capabilities, by changing uh, organizational design um, and setting up the right teams to focus on speeding up implementation timelines, that we can hit our target. I'm optimistic of that. I'd say one takeaway here is to you know take risks with this new technology, but be tractable about it. Don't bite off more than, than your organization can chew and make sure you be pointed about the deployment. And this could be a, partnering with startups, research labs, and running pilots or proof of concepts. In the industry, it's time and time again proved that these smaller deployments with really targeted scopes are, have been successful. And then you scale out from there, you know, rather than trying to, you know, implement something enterprise wide, you do sort of a step change about it. So cautious innovation would be my takeaway from this. Outstanding. Thanks all three of you for being here today. And you've given our audience a lot to think about. We really appreciate it. And we look forward to digging further into your paper and learning more about what this is all about. So again, this can be found on the Energy Central platform by searching the Indigo Advisory Group, and it will be posted in the podcast as well. Also, I'm sure these gentlemen would love to hear from you. So please leave your comments on the Energy Central platform and keep the conversation going. So until then, thanks once again to the three of you for your time today and your insight and joining us on the Energy Central Power Perspectives podcast. Thank you, Jason. Thanks, Matt. It was a pleasure. You can always reach David, Leo, and Paul through the Energy Central platform where they welcome your questions and comments. We also want to give a shout out of thanks to the podcast sponsors that made today's episode possible, to Indigo Advisory Group. Indigo works with utilities and energy companies to deliver market-leading strategy technology and innovation services. Indigo's research provides timely, actionable market intelligence for rapidly changing grid tech market. And once again, I'm your host, Jason Price. So stay plugged in and fully charged in the discussion by hopping into the community at energycentral.com. And we'll see you next time at the Energy Central Power Perspectives Podcast. Mm -hmm.